I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Matt Donovan. As the Vice President of GP Strategies Learning Solutions Group, Matt has more than 25 years of experience crafting training and development solutions with a focus on performance-driven learning. He has an MS in Instructional Systems Technology from Indiana University, and Matt has led the production of more than 300 custom online courses for Fortune 500 companies, many of which employ a scenario-based approach focusing on reinforcing authentic work practice. I worked with Matt for a number of years now, and I can say you are all in very good hands today. So without further ado, Matt, I will go ahead and turn this session over to you. Thanks, Carol. Appreciate it. And as always, a fantastic introduction. So uh, I want to say to everybody, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and share with you guys as, as, as we move through this. So uh, as Kayla mentioned, uh, and, and Kayla, please monitor the chat window as we go through. If there is a burning question or something that does pop up and it's extremely relevant to the point, uh, we can share it. But we do have a Q&A section at the end. So uh, we'll go ahead and we'll get started today. Uh, I want to share a lot with you guys on something that uh, I think has really been on the, the forefront of a lot of conversations that uh, I've been having with other folks in the industry, whether it's practitioners in the field, uh, whether it's uh, learning leaders, uh, CLO, uh, chief learning officers, and actually uh, business partners within the organizations as well. And so uh, what we're really thinking, you know, the conversation around innovation is really a, a hot topic and, and it's to always have been, but with the great amount of disruption that we're facing in, and I'd say the digital presence, the digital emergence in the business space, it's really disrupting the learning space as well. So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about how innovation centers can really help uh, organizations kind of, I think, get, get a good handle on or approach to be able to, to work through those disruptions, but not only um, what I would say is work through them, but actually harness them and put order in them so that folks can actually uh, uh, implement the ones that really are valuable and viable for an organization and kind of sort through the good and the bad. Uh, and so I, I think when we think about this, you know, innovations in our, in our design approaches really uh, are, when you think about like social mobile analytics and cloud technology, uh, they're really going a long way in supporting the goals of the learning organizations to create better learner experiences that focus more on efficacy than just efficiency. So, um, and these innovations are really kind of trying to say, how can we help solve for a better experience to drive better retention and better outcomes? comes. So before we get started, I'd like to know a little bit, just to confirm, and, and I assume that you guys joined here because it is somewhat relevant, but I would like to open up a real poll. So have you identified innovation as a critical need? And we can open that up as, as individually in your area or for your organization or for your broader training group. So uh, Kayla, I think you're going to open up the poll. Yep, the poll is now open. We'll give it about um, 30 to 45 more seconds. It's just a quick yes or no answer. It looks like folks are chiming in fairly quickly. Um, so we'll just give it about 15 to 20 more seconds and then we'll go ahead and share the results. All right, Matt, do you see those results? Absolutely. So yes for 92%, 4% for no. And uh, that's really good because uh, I'm a big believer in relevance. So uh, we can definitely proceed with the rest of this presentation. So uh, if, if there was a high identification of no, or innovation is not really important, this may have been a little more challenging of a presentation. So I'm glad to see it. But I will say that for those of you that have identified it, you're in, I would say, good company because it's definitely something we're facing uh, in variety, all verticals uh, across the partners we've been working with. So where is the disruption coming from? Because a lot of times folks ask, you know, hey, where is this pressure coming from? We've always wanted to, you know, innovate, be better, you know, but why recently has it become such a demand? And really to get our arms around, you know, what does innovation mean and or where, where is it coming from and uh, why is it pushing it? So what I'm sharing here is um, a, pull, a piece together come from the World Economic Forum, which really talks about the fourth industrial revolution. And, it's, and this is a nice graphic because it it kind of talks about the evolution over time, uh, how, how basically work and business has kind of evolved. So if you think about 3.0, which is uh, right 1969 to, you know, probably just up to about the past 
five, ten years really around automation, computers, electronics. We've been in the heyday of, of beginning to start to do that um, uh, base access through network, through technology, access to some data. But when you really look at the fourth industrial revolution, it's coming out with the cyber physical systems, uh, the internet, the networks, and that connected nature with it. And what that's really giving rise to are, are three outputs, uh, the, the digital consumer, the digital enterprise, and digital operations. And what we mean about this is that it's not about the technology itself, it's that connectedness, that social, mobile, analytics through, through big data, and then also cloud that's actually creating a pervasive, omnipresent experience uh, where a lot of businesses are translating that is to their customers. So you're seeing that the use of platforms and technologies to be able to connect people, uh, shift to a customer-centric experience, uh, which is translating into the learning space, into the learner-centric, uh, the digital enterprise's the ability to collect and use data and make decisions and thinking about how you may change the work that you do in order to better meet or create a better uh, customer or learner-centric experience. And then really around the digital operations is when you think about new technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, learning bots, uh, help desk bots, uh, those are just some examples of that. But these three things are really driving a lot of questions of, of new paradigms of the way in which we're trying to create these new systems. So within that, there's a lot of new technologies, a lot of new methodologies. Uh, I would say roles, the tasks or activities that people are doing, it's giving rise to a lot of new things. And and so as we have that shift from the three to the four, um, that's where this drive or impetus, I think, around innovation is really coming in. So what it's also resulting in for the L&D space is, is some critical mind shifts in how we go about thinking um, or, or I said approaching our work overall. So if you think of uh, from a traditional approach and the impact from the, that, that, uh, the digital consumer, the digital op operations and the digital enterprise, we're seeing a shift from just efficiency to efficacy where the primary design point is really more focusing now on the learner experience and, and a focus on, uh, I like the terminology, ruthless revel relevance um, due uh, with some of our partners uh, at Intrepid. We, we uh, share a lot around the concept of ruthless relevance. Uh, moments of need, uh, going from a single moment of need to a range of moments of need that we're trying to meet. And this, this gets back to a point of performance and a point of learner centricity or performer centricity, trying to meet their needs from first time they learn something all the way through application to when something changes or something goes wrong. How we're looking at measurements shifting from training-centric metrics uh, to business-centric metrics and, and really focusing on um, not just saying, hey, this huge transition, but can we get to an integrated, uh, sustainable map of metrics from the business and training that show how you go from a solution all the way through um, uh, actually leading and lagging indicators in the business space. Uh, shifting from speed of the process to the speed of business, finding new ways to create the content, distribute the content, make the content accessible. Um, learner connection from siloed or discrete <clears throat> to continuous or networked. And then the learner role from consumer, primary role, it's to say, hey, most organizations would create content and you will consume it, to really opening up the social learning roles around that we're now expecting our learners or performers to be consumers, contributors, collaborators, moderators. They're taking on a bigger role in the delivery <clears throat> excuse me, in the delivery of relevant content for uh, peers and themselves. And uh, the last two around the process foundation, looking at a waterfall and systematic, uh, ADI obviously is one of them, two uh, programs that are really more agile design and systemic, uh, and looking at things that are bringing in, whether you talk about, you know, successive approximation or you're looking at agile or design thinking, bringing those in. Uh, they're definitely much more around saying, you know, what does good look like when we don't know what good looks like? How do we get to that? Uh, and the last one is organization, or uh, their, I guess their value point for learning uh, is learning as discrete and transactional activities versus a holistic and integrated systems that, that learning is a part of. 
And, and what I'm saying, it's not a black and white issue. There are elements like, for example, we're not going to ever get rid of training-centered uh, metrics, but we need to integrate them into a bigger picture. So it's another either or, but what we're finding is that we're expanding uh, the ways in which we're looking at the, uh, the picture, actually getting much bigger and, and almost making learning as an enabler much more of a transparent part of the organization rather than a more significant pass-through, really trying to get, as we move from efficiency to efficacy. So how does this uh, really bring us, you know, to, to the concept of innovation? Well, in order to do all of that, uh, there's a lot of things that have to be in place with new technologies, new design methodologies, a whole range of things. So uh, we have another poll here. I just want to kind of see with you guys. Are, are you also, uh, I know I've had some conversations, but do you guys also feel that you struggle with staying up to date? And, and I've just thrown a couple of innovative approaches over here, knowing what they are, strengths, weaknesses, all of that. Uh, so I think, uh, Kaylee, you're going to open it up. We've got uh, some time we're going to set, but uh, are you guys struggling with staying up to date on these? Yep, so the, poll, the poll is now open. We've got about um, 20 seconds left in this poll. Again, it's just a quick yes or no. This will be our last poll for today, um, but a very important one. So if you haven't had a chance yet, go ahead and input your answer, and we'll compile the uh, results here just shortly. All right, Matt, can you see the results? Ah, uh, fantastic. Well, that's good. 82% uh, uh, do do share. I think uh, even myself personally, trying to stay up to date on all of these, uh, not only the concepts uh, or the types of pieces, but all the new third-party platforms or technologies that are coming um, to, to bear or are available to help us do that. So, 82% are struggling, and 18% uh, uh, of you seem to really have it mastered. So, uh, hopefully, we'll uh, uh, get some opportunities for you guys to kind of share some of your techniques in addition to innovation centers as we move forward. So uh, it, it is good to feel that you know, this is something I've seen that a lot of folks are seeing that the need and desire to be um, on top of innovation is, is high, but also the variation and the disruptions and the new entrants and the fragmentation of uh, what I would say the learning technology space has really put a lot of pressure to really stay on top of innovation and have a true understanding of so many offerings, so many approaches out there. So let's take a look at uh, the next slide. Here we go. So what is a digital learning innovation center? So uh, it's simply put, it's a physical or virtual space within an organization where uh, basically people within the organization can explore, innovate, and refine without disrupting critical day-to-day -day activities. And it sounds you know, pretty straightforward, but, but one of the critical elements here is, is that when we try and integrate innovation, like for example, we have a, a mission critical program we're trying to roll out. Uh, we want to roll it out company-wide, global, multiple countries, and we want to innovate and bring in both a new design-centric process, but we also want to use, say, a new adaptive learning platform blended with some video coaching platforms. We're trying to bring new things in. When you have a mission critical initiative, you're trying to get it maybe into past security or you're trying to figure out how do you design optimize for it. At the moment of a critical launch is probably not always the ideal way to kind of try out new technologies. And there's so many factors with uh, big key initiatives that play in just success without adding in some of those other complexities. So what, what I've been advocating for a while is to find a way where you can bring a space where you can innovate, explore, test the viability, look at what, you know, not only whether it's good or bad, but what makes it good in terms of application or where is it not as strong, or refine your practice around like, uh, you know, a new approaches or methodologies. So you have to create a space in the organization where you can safely explore without uh, risking or, or being challenging for, uh, you know, key mission critical day-to-day -day activities moving forward. Uh, but otherwise, folks feel, well, if I don't, if I don't attach it to a mission critical 
initiative, we will never innovate. And, and that's the other thing is that what you got to have in place is really organizational commitment to create a space, a safe space where you can come in, play, work with those things in order to really think through almost a scientific process of exploration, uh, enhancement, refinement, and, and really come to some good evidence-based practices to make decisions on the viability of, of, of whatever your, the, the focus of your innovation is. So why are they supported? That's so important. And again, change we know is so rapid, it's not going to slow down. There will be new technologies, new features, new ways to connect learners. There will be new ways to design and develop. There will be new roles that emerge that need to be supported or integrated in the process. Ongoing innovation is, is a requirement. I mean, it, you're going to have to find a way to uh, efficiently and effectively uh, really integrate innovation as a practice into it. Historically, uh, not surprising, uh, L&D organizations have been, I think, slow and unresponsive to, to a high volatility. And this gets back to really from an organizational need to be efficient in the deployment of training, to meet a lot of needs, um, and, and be a stable organization. When you have stabi stability, repeatability, consistency, that's really what you like to see in some of the L&D organizations. Disruptive uh, new practices and innovation can sometimes clash. So how do you help an organization which has benefited from one condition open itself up for another one? And then, you know, successful organizations are really about asking the right questions, finding ways to connect in innovative ideas and processes. So not only innovate, explore, but also be able to communicate, document, and share, and then ultimately transition those into successful applications. So how are they being used? And this is, you know, as an emerging practice, we do this not only within GP strategies uh, across our organization, but we also do this uh, in different areas with our partner organizations. And the goal is really to accelerate digital learning strategies, things that, you know, uh, like we talk about a little bit like adaptive learning. So when we're with a partner who's considering it, you know, you may be able to define or tell me what an adaptive learning program is, but how many folks have actually been in a platform, have been able to explore with it, understand the, the benefits, the, the investments, uh, the ways in which you may have to change either your design practices, your development practices, um, you know, what degree of customization you may be able to entertain. So, you know, take a topic like that and, and being able to have a place that's away from the critical day-to-day -day activities where you can explore, innovate, refine, learn about these, actually using the tools, playing with them with a low barrier access to them, a predictable and repeatable process so that as you are, whether it's adaptive learning or the 93 million other opportunities out there, how do you have a good intake process, a standardized process, et cetera? Um, an approach for supporting practitioners uh, in innovative efforts in the field. This is also not about trying to centralize all innovation to a central point, you want to be able to support practitioners in the field, but those that are going to be trying out field-based innovation, how can you help them codify, document, evaluate in a consistent scientific method and then be able to share across the organization, um, which is the next bullet point. And the last one is really around a proactive that is really capable of having an ongoing sustainable innovation practice for whatever comes up, how will you make yourself more educated on the strengths, the weaknesses, uh, benefits, and is it really a good fit for where you guys need to go? The benefits, again, sustainable approach, effective response to disruptions, shorter times between idea and execution. If you create space where you can come in and, and have a structured approach to this, you can actually shorten the time between the, an idea or a new uh, field or emerging practice in the, in, the, in the field and then getting it through a viability assessment and actually about into the field. So that repeatable process allows you to streamline and, and make that quicker. Cultivating innovation solutions, uh, increasing potential, idea potential while decreasing risk. Again, this creates a place that's not only putting day-to-day -day activities at risk, but you can put it into uh, defining the right types of activities to be able to explore that are low risk, low barrier. Uh, productive innovation with fewer negative disruptions. So we've talked about that. These are the key benefits. Uh, the next one is what are some critical success factors? Uh, and these are really important, and I think this goes for 
innovation centers in general across an organization, but they definitely apply within the LD space, is that you have to have dedicated resources. You have to have somebody who's accountable for structuring the, the intake process, overseeing the activity, ensuring that you've got a good public, publication schedule, a publishing schedule, um, somebody who's going to be uh, really uh, kind of a champion for an innovative or design-centric culture and is constantly evangelizing around that. Um, you're going to have to have an open innovation strategy, an ability to, to take in that risk, fail forward, learn from it, but ultimately drive uh, an evidence-based approach. Uh, a process for nourishing innovation, and, and again, that, that space, you have to have a, a way to kind of feed it and protect it, because if you, the assumption is that you're going to be pumping out the next uh, eureka moment every four months, and it's, everything's going to change the world, that's probably not the right perspective. But what we're trying to is right-size the idea of around innovations, and innovations can be small or they can be bigger. They can be attached to application, new processes, new approaches, and definitely new technologies. But the idea is to say not everything's going to be a win. Not everything is going to be have high return on investment. Uh, the next one I think is really important is that you have to have a focus on being a clearinghouse on innovation activities and outputs. You want to be able to connect the organization, make sure that they're networked, able to work through, um, and, and say, hey, I'm working on this. You may be working on something near that. Um, can we talk and share a little bit about what's going on, make connections with emerging practices or innovative practices? So that you have to have somebody who's accountable for being able to drive and make those connections. Uh, facilitation of viable innovations from insight to operations. So sometimes we learned about it, we played with it, but we never did anything with it. So the idea is to say around these innovations, be able to track a plan for them, whether it's like, you know, the viability wasn't really reached, but we closed our experiment cycle on it. We had a hypothesis, we tested it, we gathered data, and here's the conclusion, and here's what we're going to do with it. But you're actually closing your experimentation around it. And the last one really is around enabling conversations between teams, and it gets back to that networking with it. So these are some of the things you've got to create space, reinforce the ways in which people connect, and have that accountability. I think one of the challenges is when we expect our practitioners to do all of our innovation off the side of their desk, and they're so busy trying to deliver excellence every day, but they don't have time to document and share with others, because that is uh, you know something that takes a lot of time and energy to do, but if you were able to put just a little bit of support in to help enable that, you would get a great return on that investment. And that's really around that center of, of innovation is what that's about. With this, uh, we've kind of identified, you know, a pretty straightforward um, uh, a process, but there are five base, research-based behaviors that are really supporting that as you go through. And this really gets back to the base fundamentals, things that we go back to in elementary school when we start to the basics of a scientific method and thinking about how do we learn about things in our world. Um, and it starts with observing, coming up with critical questions, um, experimenting. And then networking with other people that are also maybe working with that or raising questions or driving answers. And then ultimately is associating, making connections around those. So it's not just a practice of, hey, we learned something, but, but being able to deliver it to success by sharing it, getting uptake in it, getting feedback as we, uh, you know, how valuable it may have been, uh, I applied it here. And the beautiful part about this is that you can have a range of successive questions. We may ask, say, on an adaptive learning platform, um, what's the viability? Will it work really well in this instance? And it says, okay, well, maybe would it work in this type of an instance? And you could set up a second experiment to do or a pilot to do a test, uh, test around that. So you don't have to cram everything into a single test with it, but it's a series of questioning and a methodology around to be able to drive the answers for that. So trying to keep it really simple, our process is really five steps. It comes out with starting off with discovery, refinement, experimentation, reflection and sharing, and then integrating the viable solutions into the workplace really about that, that operationalization of, of, of an innovation. 
And so the first one is really saying, hey, what's out there, discovery? What's out there? Uh, just This is basically just searching, finding things that are in the industry or near the industry, constantly looking for new things in this steady stream of new elements to actually begin to, um, you know, learn about. And that's where really you move into the refinement, which is, you know, refining the questions you're trying to ask about it to uh, really refine your understanding of what it is, how it may be applied, and really starting to structure a relevant question which gets into your experimentation. So you start off with hypothesis, and then how will we actually measure or gain feedback or data and information around that? And then ultimately, when you've done an experiment, the important part is to reflect and share. Hey, we did this. This is what happened. And now it's the so what. What now is really around that, that reflection and sharing and saying, what did we learn? What do we know about this? There's always new questions that kind of come out with this. But, you know, what I find is that, you know, people will definitely go out and they'll discover, I want to learn a little bit about this. They may even get to refinement. Occasionally you'll get to experimentation um, with, with a light, hey, let's do a, a quick test or maybe a demo uh, with some questions around it. But what I don't see in a lot of organizations is really the commitment to reflection and sharing and then ultimately operationalizing those. And it's kind of a commitment to be able to do that on a repeatable, sustainable process. And again, this is why I get back to the importance of kind of creating a small but mighty group um, that is focused and accountable for really pulling everything through this five-step process. So when we look at things and, and types of innovation, and what I mean is around uh, innovation exploration when we look at this, there's a demonstration, which is, you know, if we're talking about uh, I'd like to see a new process, approach, technique, or platform or technology, can I first get exposure to it? What is it? What does it look like? Give me at least more intimate understanding of what it is. So, so these are definitely increasing levels of intimacy with whatever it is. So the first one is let me see it, I get to ask some questions. When you get into exploration, now I may get access to it. I may be able to try and play around in it. I may be able to build in it. Uh, you may um, ultimately move into a test and learn, which is uh, where you set up a simulated but authentic experience that's low barrier, low risk in terms of content or um, exposure, but you bring people in and start to really see how does it work. And then the last one is a pilot, which is a really a more formalized study, being able to show, you know, how can, uh, where you're really trying to show some key impacts, and that's where you get to really good design of an experiment, is really around your pilot. So you have increasing levels of intimacy, exploration with these, and, and as you kind of have discovered or brought in uh, new ideas, new concepts, new platforms, whatever, you kind of progress them through here as they kind of get through a viability gate. Uh, you may go through and see a demonstration, and that may be enough stop at the moment. You put it on the shelf and say, maybe we'll come back to it later. But uh, if there's some quick, you know, there's some value in proceeding to the next gate, then absolutely put some energy. And I think it's one of the things that when you work in an innovation center, you got to really look at how you're going to prioritize all the things that come in. And so you can probably handle quite a few quick demos, but that's that first assessment before you pass it to the next gate is saying, what's really going to be worth our time and energy to move? to each successive level of effort. The part that I can't, you know, uh, I, I don't think I can emphasize enough is that with the complexities of the learning journeys that we are creating using the platforms, the social, the mobile, the analytical, the, the cloud where the data is located and how it all moves, these are becoming very complex. They are things that you have to become intimate with to truly understand. And you can't come in in 30 minutes and totally understand it because many of these are tied to social, which unfolds over time, and, and you'll see how it plays out over time based off how people are actually interacting with them. So, so you can't just take like the 30, uh, you know, the quick sip, the Pepsi challenge. You kind of have to live with it to understand it and, and do that. But we're trying to look at simpler, easier ways to bring folks into it. And, and these are progressive levels of intimacy that allow us to do that. So let's go to the next one. Here's one that I just want to show you as a quick example of something that uh, we've done. And, and this is an example of augmented reality. And so within GPN, with a partner uh, that we actually did, this is an example of how we started up on augmented reality. And so I was working with the internal team, and we had a partner who had some interest in this and said, hey, let's just try something real quick. Let's do a, a quick test and learn. Let's take a look at some technology. They had a challenge of how could we create 
a, a sales experience, um, more interactive physical sales experience, how can we make it more interactive to learn about a product. And, and what you're actually looking at here is a poster that we've created which does two things. And we're able to put them in physical spaces either in our innovation center here at GP Strategies or we're able to share these with our client partners. But the idea is that there are these small little activities on the in the lower right hand corner. You can actually see where you can use uh, an app off of your phone and you hover over it and it'll bring up a corresponding video with it or it shows you from an augmented reality how it works. So we don't just tell what it is, we talk about its application. These are things that we learned about it, but we give people a hands-on opportunity through your device, try it out. If you haven't done it, here's a quick way to try it out. We've done this with, uh, for example, another one is on uh, virtual reality. We created a very quick virtual reality um, uh, you know, app to try out, or not an app, but it was an experience in which you were able to use Google Cardboard. And again, this one was all about how can we get low barrier uh, exposure and intimate understanding on what it is. So we created for very, you know, you know mod modest cost, we created a virtual experiment uh, and we shared it with uh, our customers at an event and people were able to go in and see it and interact and start to get a feel with what it is. And so again, the post talks about what it is, we're reinforcing in our physical space, we can also talk about it virtually, but we've created things where folks on their own could go in and actually play with them. So again, this is these are outputs from our experiences and our exercises, but it also allows folks to not only learn about it, but share it. We've published it and pushed it out, so completing that full cycle. The last one was around iBeacons, for example, uh, as a way another geophysical presence, uh, you know, how how does it work? How does it work? How do we, you know, be able to show an exercise? This was another one where we had uh, an activity for folks to actually come in. Um, uh, it was part of our customer forum where folks were able to actually come in and interact in a very quick, rapid way to interact and see what the technology is, how it functions, so that they can get to the le next level of applications for themselves. And so. Let's focus on how to get started, because uh, I want to move here into Q&A pretty quickly. Um, so again, just if you wanted to do one tomorrow, you know, so I would start with engage a cross-functional team, create space for them, ensure that they have resources, time, and accountability for success. Um, you know, start to document the current innovation activities. You start with where are they, what's going on. You start to wrap around a structure of that, that scientific, you know, process of saying, where are you guys at? What was the question you were trying to answer? What are your conclusions? Um, and that kind of rolls into a rolling uh, learning innovation plan. Start to get, as you discover new ones that you want to move through those levels of, of experimentation, get them on a plan, prioritize them. And make sure that you have a, a sustainable process around prioritizing those, conducting the experiments, documenting the results, and getting them published out there, which pulls in to publish and share. And, and really, for those that have gotten to viability, drive the operationalization of those. Where have they been successful? What did it take to succeed? And that big moves from almost best practice to a standardized practice in the organization. And what we're really talking about is a repeatable, sustainable approach to innovation that allows us to basically respond to the constant disruptions that we see uh, in the field uh, as we're moving through. So I uh, wanted to move into, let's see, it's forwarding. Closing that basically, you know, in closing, the organizations really need to adapt in order to remain relevant. We need to shift our key mindsets within our learning spaces and their learners about how do we respond to change and disruption and innovation as part of that. We really need to develop the skills to identify trends and signals earlier, and this gets back to um, that innovation where you start off with discovery, the trends and signals we're seeing, we start to become more familiar and intimate with them through the innovation, uh, whether it's the platforms, techniques, uh, approaches, processes, and get better at determining when it's time to shift towards that innovation and get it implemented. 
And, and I really think that, you know, it, when it comes to innovation, being able to put a sustainable process in it, you know, I, I kind of go back to Deming was talking about in the sense that it, it's not necessarily to change as survival is not mandatory. And it comes back to really embracing innovation, leaning into it, and being able to turn it into not just something you're managing, but you're actually turning into a, a competitive advantage. So I want to turn it over for some uh, questions. So we're at the Q&A portion, so I know we've got some, a couple of minutes. So uh, Kayla, you want to open yeah. this up? Oh, yes, and there are a lot of questions coming in. So Matt, I hope you're prepared <laughs> for about the next Okay, minute. I'll do what I can. Uh -huh. But anyway, well, thank you, Matt, for the great presentation. And as you mentioned, we've got about 10 minutes left. So as a reminder, if you do have a question for him, be sure to enter it into the Q&A module at this time. Um, you can also put it in the chat. That will go to me directly, and I'll make sure to relay that over to Matt during our Q&A panel. Um, he's obviously covered a lot in the past 30, 35 minutes, and there's still a lot more information we could discuss. So we do encourage that you continue the conversation with Matt beyond today's session. His contact information is available on the slide deck. So Matt, um, you want to go ahead and flip it to your last slide so everyone can see your lovely contact information. And we'll also be sending everyone a link to a follow-up blog post where Matt will be addressing some of the key takeaways from today. Um, I'd also like, as a final reminder, uh, to let you know that the recording and the slides from today will be sent out to the email address that you provided when you registered. So we will jump into these questions because, again, they are coming in quickly. Um, so the first one is, what are some of the challenges innovation centers face in organizations? Well, I think some of the challenges that we, we see is that, you know, sometimes organizations put pressure on innovation centers to create this eureka moment, and you're supposed to have this game-changing innovation always coming out of it. And I think that that's kind of a myth around the concept of innovation. It can be, you know, revolutionary innovation is far less a reality than evolutionary innovation. And so sometimes there's an overemphasis on revolutionary innovation. And and I think it's sometimes it's almost as important to figure out what not to invest in as it is to know what to invest in. So those failures can actually be just as as important or more important than actually some of those wins. So, so knowing where to redirect your effort, knowing that we have finite access to resources. So that's one of the key challenges. I'm sure there are probably plenty more that you could address in the blog post as oh, well. Yeah. Uh, so how do you measure success for innovation centers? Uh, that's a great question, and I think when you start to look at an adoption and a throughput, so so on, on a couple different layers, I think one of it is is you know a sustained output. So that publishing of of relevant um, you know learnings and, and repeatable processes, starting to you know are we getting it out regularly? Are we maintaining a good practice around that? So those are good early indicators. But when you start to really see the flow of feedback and, and really start to see, I think is that under undercurrent of back and forth with the field to the innovation center and helping the whole system actually drive relevance around the innovations. Uh, you start to see people buying into things, sharing more. You, you don't have to do a mass you know, advertising push. People are pulling and desiring and, and really engaging in the process, but it's done in a sustainable way. So the next question I think is probably something that several folks on the call are maybe struggling with, but this person in particular says, as a nonprofit, we're limited in dollars to devote to a formal innovation process. Do you have any recommendations on how to move forward in spite of those limitations? Well, I think, you know, I think in today's society where I've started to look at cooperative areas around innovation, so can you work with other nonprofits to start to do a shared resourcing around innovation so it's not tied to one area to do that, um, either either like in your space or it can also be with others in your, in your in a regional space or area, but you don't have to own it all for yourself. And sometimes for the betterment of the nonprofit, you can actually partner with others uh, to do some experimentation to share that across a couple of groups. And then um, I know that, you know, for, you know, there are some places that are starting to pop up to help nonprofits with that practice of innovation. So uh, in small pockets of areas, there, there's a, uh, what I would say is a, is a fabric of folks that are able to help uh, nonprofits innovate. Uh, there's one that's always been around for a long time, was Lingos, for example. Uh, but there are others that are able to kind of help that sustain ability to support uh, a whole range of organizations, but nonprofits specifically. 
Great, and the questions still keep coming in. We've got about, we'll give it about five more minutes um, for the Q&A discussion. We might go a few minutes over if we just have one or two left. But um, the next one is, uh, which platforms are better out of the box for learning and development? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, and that's, and that's really, that question is really part of why this process is so important around experimentation because it, it's a hard one to answer because it all goes back to context. And depending on what your need is, what the application is, sometimes an out-of-the-box application may be really good for what you need. Um, and, and the only way you're going to know that is to be able to start the experimentation, the test and learn, and, and really figuring that out in the context uh, of your organization or what you're trying to achieve. So that, that's a great question that we get. The only way to really answer that is to dig into it and find out what the features are out of the box. What you may also find is that your business needs, your business challenge, or your goal may actually require customization in certain areas, and that's where you kind of got to look at, say, what opportunities do you have for customization? Do you need a platform? You know, two platforms may be great in comparison. One is really great out of the box, but when it comes to customization, not a whole lot of options. So you get some uh, a quick uh, movement forward, but you really, once you've kind of grown beyond it, it's hard to change. So those are the kind of things that you do want to put into your test and learns to explore. How can you grow with them? Uh, what's the functionality out of the box? How much support does it really require to get a return on that investment? And being able to look at a couple of options, you know, uh, in the same category. Uh, if you're looking at curation platforms, if you're looking at adaptive learning platforms, if you're looking at just collaboration platforms, being able to look and explore a lot of them. There are so many features that, that benefit so many different contexts. You're only going to know through the experimentation process. When you are very familiar with the next question, does DP Strategies have an innovation center? <laughs> Yes, it is, it is something that we are bringing together, so we are uh, centralizing around that, and we've had, uh, throughout our different organizations, we've been focusing on innovation, I would say, uh, in our verticals for a long time. We've got a lot of great practitioners that are working with uh, great partners that have been doing innovation, and so what we've been doing is centralizing and bringing in um, to be able to share those lessons learned within that group and being able to distribute across GP, and then also uh, as we partner with organizations and it makes sense, can we share those across our partners and be able to see what other folks are doing? Obviously, you know, balancing the respect for, you know, intellectual property or certain innovations. So we want to be able to share lessons learned without sharing, obviously, or compromising any, you know, business critical information with our partners. So that's a heavy part of what we're trying to do is to distribute and publish and write more on uh, so that we can push those out. So we are working on uh, our first set of findings. We're actually got our uh, innovation plan uh, kind of laid out coming into 2018, what we're going to be exploring and working on. I will tell you AI is, is a big part of 2018 where we're going to try and look at what's in the field, uh, what partners, and, and several things are coming online. So um, as we look into 2018, we'll be doing definitely more with that. The next question I'm going to jump into is, uh, do innovation centers have to be fixed or can they be temporary spaces that you gather, create, and assemble for a few weeks a year, for example? And I'm going to add on to this one because as a remote worker, um, you know, how are you supporting your remote workforce as well? Absolutely, and I think that, so, so what needs to be consistent is, I would say, the accountability and the resources and the structure, the kind of the oversight, the people that are uh, maintaining the architecture of the experience. But you can ramp it up or shut it down for periods of time. You can do bursts either centrally or you can do virtual collaboration spaces. Um, I know that there's several organizations, and this is something GP has been exploring, is to look into what we call these kind of collaboration spaces where we can do remote and local collaboration and learning about this, where we do those test and learns or, or go through those so that you can blend um, a physical and a virtual presence. Because we know that we can't bring everybody at a spot moment to always innovate in a 
the same space, same location. But what we are trying to do is find ways that either we can still get the benefit for those that can come together, but also have a near quality experience for those that can remotely participate. But even if you can't at the moment of a come together uh, concept, whether you call it a hackathon or an, or an innovation summit or a, a collaboration spark, whatever you want to call it, those are kind of these centralized near time experiences. You can also benefit from the outputs of those over time and create spaces where people can have ongoing dialogue, continuously um, add to uh, the dialogue around a certain platform or innovation. So virtually you can still pull and share and grow with it. So, so I would say yes to all of those, and and there we're getting. Uh, I wouldn't say anybody's absolutely got it nailed, um, but I would say that we're getting better uh, every day to try and do that to create that balanced experience between virtual and local. But um, there are some organizations I think that are pushing the boundaries of that, um, bigger investments in, in connective technology. So, uh, Kayla, great question. Well, thank you, Matt. And uh, this brings us to the end of our 45 minutes. I want to be respectful of time. So we, we do have a few questions we did not get to. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, Matt has agreed to do a blog post. We'll be including that in the email follow-up that you will all receive on Monday. And that will include all of the Q&A from today and his answers, which typically will be a little bit longer and more informative than even we were able to get to in the Q&A during the discussion today. So that will be sent to everyone um, to the email that you provided when you registered. I apologize if we did not get to your question, but Matt will certainly be able to answer it in that blog post. So thanks again to today's speaker, Matt Donovan, and thank you to everyone who attended for your time and attention. We do hope that you'll join us again for our next webinar, which is an annual one that we do. We partner with Training Industry. It is actually hosted through them. It is on Casting Success, a look ahead at digital learning trends for 2018 and beyond. And that helps to kick off our own 2018 Learning Trends series, which will start in January. We'll have a weekly webinar um, that will hit on every one of the topics that Don Duquette will be bringing up during his Learning Trends session. And we hope that you, um, that you can join us. So have a great day, everyone, and thank you again for joining.